it has uh, has kept going all the way through. Um, like the the rest of the room, there was a lot of tears and upset and uh, the September the 19th, um, and a lot of picking over how things had to be. One of the groups that just kept going and uh, kept putting the arguments forward, kept campaigning all the way through, uh, was uh, Kat is uh, head of, her energy and enthusiasm and her youth, I have to say, are very, very welcome in this campaign, a room full of grey here, I'm only kidding. Um, but, but it is, we have to engage as many young people and I think they did an amazing job through the Radical Independence campaign of engaging so many people in the areas we needed them to be engaged. So please give it up for Cat Boyd. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, apologies to anyone who was expecting Jonathan Shafi. I'm standing in for him today. And like Sarah said, it feels like a long time since I've been at an event like this. It's really nice to be at an event like this again. But apologies if I'm a bit rusty, but I'm sure you'll be a nicer audience than question time was. <laughs> It's weird being in this room particularly because five years ago in this room, Radical Independence came together for our first conference and we made our own case for independence. But I'm not here today to repeat that argument and instead I think it's really healthy that we're all coming together today to find a way forward. But I want to draw a little bit on my experience as a Radical Independence campaigner and as a trade union organiser to indicate where I think our majority for independence can come from. Now I helped set up Radical Independence with a group of really, really talented activists from across the country. We wanted to present a different style of campaigning, one that focused on the missing millions in Scotland rather than that kind of like traditional middle class swing voter. And given the stalemate at the time at Westminster, with the three main parties all committed to austerity, we wanted to go out and speak to people who had been continually marginalised by society. We wanted to persuade them of the opportunity that the referendum presented and that Scotland when it was independent, didn't need to repeat any of the mistakes that Britain had made. But we didn't just want to get the working class out to vote. And I think that that's quite a big perception of what radical independence did, but it was so much more than that, because we recognised that our efforts in the campaign would be pointless unless independence actually improved the lives of ordinary people by giving us real, genuine power and sovereignty over our lives. That independence was a genuine rebellion against the alienation that we had felt for decades. But 2017, although it's just started, is a very different year. Three years on, we have a Labour Party leadership that's sympathetic to some of our goals, but definitely not all of our goals. And it's a marked shift in such a short space of time, but Labour is also chronically weak. In Scotland, they're nowhere. Indeed, Scotland's opposition is now centre-right and British nationalist to the core. The Scottish Government is stronger, and the SNP, of course, our biggest pro-independence party, looks invincible in elections. But my worry is, for how long? And I saw something on Twitter the other day, it was um, uh, Bookies uh, making Ruth Davidson the odds-on favourite to become the next First Minister after Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Their perception behind that, by the way, is that if Scotland can't make the break to independence, then the pro-independence party's popularity will wane. Our invincibility as a movement will begin to crumble and it will leave the Scottish Tories to pounce. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but I think that that's something worth thinking about. Because one option is to batten down the hatches and to continue to stay in government for as long as possible. But look at what's happening all around the world. The current trend suggests that quite often voters are out to punish political establishments who they perceive to be political insiders. Now, our government is not at that stage, but these bookies are predicting that perhaps that would happen. That's why I want independence sooner rather than later, by the way. But all of, 
But all of this is part of the reason why old social democratic parties across the world are failing. They're sticking to quite established economic formulas that won't work, whilst the political right are playing the simple one note tune of demanding to shut the bloody borders. And in case I'm misunderstood, let me be clear, all I see is globally is that one note political right winning. And it wasn't Donald Trump that won in the American election, it was Hillary Clinton that lost. Now, at the moment, it's the right wing who have the banner of protest and rebellion. And if we don't reclaim it back for ourselves, I genuinely worry we will suffer the same fate of political establishments across the world. And we will all be punished. It is not just a party political thing, whether you're SNP, Green, Socialist. If we look like a political establishment, if we look like a closed movement, we'll all suffer together, regardless of who's really to blame. So what now? Well, let me start with my own experience. Now, I'm a trade union organiser, that's my job. It's my job to go into workplaces and get people to organise and protest in their workplaces at a time when they feel alone and powerless at work. And it's far, far tougher than political campaigning, even tougher than the Rise election campaign of 2016. Um, but people today do still feel like they've got some influence over parliamentary politics, even if it's really, really remote. But at work, in the workplaces, time and time again, people feel like they are just getting shafted. And the worst part of it is that people are getting used to it. My job as a trade union organiser is to raise people's expectations, to help people genuinely believe that precarious contracts, shit pay, bad bosses are not an inevitability, that this is not the best you can expect. <coughs> My job is to raise workers' expectations by helping them realise that they've got a bit of power, they've got a bit of agency. And that might be my day job, but it got me thinking that I think that's what a lot of us do politically. That's what we want in the independence movement, is that we want to show that austerity is not an inevitability, that nuclear weapons are not an inevitability. We want to raise people's expectations. Now, in the unions, I've learned lots of lessons of how not to do things, but <laughs> I've seen old methods used and fail. I've seen decline in the trade union movement. I've also seen the start of a recovery. And we're starting to, in the, movement, in the union movement, get to grips with our own role and think of different ways of doing things. Uh, I think it's the duty of everyone in this room to raise expectations of every single person in Scotland. And it has to come from the independence movement. It's what makes us a positive movement. It means that we fight austerity wherever cuts come from. It means that we fight racism and sexism wherever it occurs. It means that you know, we join a union and we participate in our workplaces and we fight and stand up for our colleagues. And let me explain a little bit further. I think that often as a movement, a broad independence, yes movement. I include radical independence in this. This is something that I've learned from the trade unions, is that we concentrate on mobilising for events. We decide to put on an event, we stick it up on Facebook, we do a leaflet. We concentrate on mobilising our activists. We concentrate on mobilising the vote. And yeah, that does bring significant numbers of people to our events. It does get people out to vote. But generally, the people who are mobilised are already convinced. They're already committed activists. They are not the mass of the workplace or the community. Mobilising, in my view, is a tactic that fails when we get the same familiar faces in a room over and over again. We put the same people on the same panels, we put the same messages across the same way, and then we go home. And that's what trade unions and socialist organisations have done for decades, and it's failed. Instead of just mobilising our own side, we need to organise the unconvinced, the people who are not here today for whatever reason. One of my favourite kind of go-to people um, in terms of trade union organising is an American writer called Jane McAlevey. She calls this deep organising. And what she means by that is organising within any networks that we have to continually expand our base, to continually expand the amount of people we are talking to. And we need to be honest with ourselves about this. It's not going to be us in this room today 
that win that second referendum. Instead, every single one of us has a responsibility to go out of here and find new leaders for our movement. It means mapping out our communities. It means extending a hand to people who might not have been convinced last time round. And five years ago, at that RIT conference that I mentioned, we offered an example of, of that real organising, and I think other groups did too. On our opening panel in 2012, um, arguably there was only one person on that panel that anybody knew. Everyone else was like, who are these folks? And it was Jean Urquhart. Now, Jean had just quit the SNP over the question of NATO. She was a dissident. The rest of the panel were disability rights activists, workplace activists like myself, anti-war activists, mostly not in a political party. And during that last campaign, it was those new voices that made the campaign dynamic and interesting. And it's what's built today's event. They weren't necessarily the loudest people, but they were people with networks who knew other people, who could influence different networks, influence different groups, influence different parts of Scottish society. They were people who were trusted by groups that the independence campaign hadn't quite reached yet. They had a knowledge and an insight that was different from the mainstream campaign. And that, all those networks, all that diversity really, really changed things. And I think that we cannot lose that sense of renewal. We can't let our movement start to look like the same old faces. I include my face in this, by the way, as well. There is new talent and potential everywhere. We can't forget the lessons that made us strong. There are lots of well-meaning motions and great statements by the same old people, including myself, but if it's just the same people saying it over and over again, our networks and our influence and our power will get thinner and thinner. So let's organise to find new voices, new experiences, people who haven't found the confidence to become outspoken yet. Let's organise events to help and support them, express themselves in public, to tell their own story. Let's give them a platform to speak about independence, their hopes, their concerns, their dreams, their fears, and let's renew our movement. I think that as well as doing that real deep organising, finding these new people who are out there, they are out there, that we need to look at where we failed in 2014, not because I want to be a typical goth or anything, but because I think understanding our failure is key to winning next time round. Where can we win next time round? Well, in 2014, we didn't win the working class. Well, it's unfashionable to talk about the working class. I know people can feel uncomfortable um, talking about class, even in this context. But it matters. It matters so much if we want independence, because let's remember the working class are the majority of people. It's the 99%, those who have to work every day and have very little choice or individual power over the matter. If we don't win over the working class, if we don't win over the 99%, we will never win the majority. And last time, broadly, I think the Yes movement won the most disadvantaged sections of the working class, people who were getting done in by austerity. But people in public sector workplaces, semi-skilled jobs, many working women, young people trapped in student debt and zero hours contracts jobs, weren't convinced or weren't convinced enough to vote. Now, this is where it all comes together for me, because working people across the world are being won to an anti-establishment protest message because the failure of centre ground politics is just becoming a graveyard. Now, it's our job to convince people that change is going to happen, whatever we do. And the best kind of change is change that is done under our control, not change that is done unto us by others. As Howard Zinn once said, you can't stay neutral on a moving train. And it's nice, it's nice to be brought back together today with the people who brought 2014 alive. But the world is changing fast and it's scary and it's strange. Next time, we've got to be nimble and new and create a new dynamic movement because our opponents still have great wealth and great power. Let's not forget that we got here as a movement of protest against an establishment and we put new voices at the centre stage of that movement and if we remember those lessons, we win next time. If we don't, without that authority of protest and renewal, we're destined 
to go the way of political establishments who get too comfortable and only speak to themselves. I'll finish on this. Everyone speaking here today has a really important role to play. Everyone here today has a special and unique wisdom. All of those experiences matter. And think about who you know, someone who has access to a different network of people, a different social circle and a different workplace that you can speak to, to try and convince, to talk about independence, to think about the possibilities that it gives. As Gramsci said, every human being has that capacity to lead people's thoughts. And ultimately, it's the insights and knowledge of millions of people that will make sure we win next time. If we use our experience properly to seek out diverse voices, to promote dissidence, to reflect the real majority of society, to reflect the 99%, then 2018, 2019, 2020, or whenever will be our year. Then comes the real challenge, to make an independent Scotland better for the working class majority. Thank you.